the sadness from wherever you've been. to Ephesians chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and we'll get you a Bible and put it in your hand. Okay. Well, while you're turning in, uh, in Ephesians, to, uh, to Ephesians chapter 4, uh, last Sunday after, after church was over and things wound down, Denise and I uh, put our daughter-in-law Carrie and our two grandkids in the car and, and took off for California. And uh, our daughter-in-law had never been to uh, Disneyland, or or the grandkids, of course, and you know, and so uh, uh, that was a big thing. This was, you know, so we're taking her west slowly, one step at a time. And so we got to stay at my mom's and had a sweet time, and we went down and, and uh, drove through parts of Hollywood, and she just she's had a great time. But uh, I got to tell you, Disneyland was something else. When I was a teenager, we had a season pass. Uh, to go down there. Yeah, I had a cousin who, who and so uh, one summer we went like every week, but now it's, it's just, it, they've got that whole theme park, and it's, man, I'll tell you, there was more people there than I'd ever seen in one place in my entire life, uh, and it was a Tuesday. <laughs> y- yeah, 
Yeah, and it wore me out. I was, you know, we, we had taken my mom down to the beach on a Monday, and, and she stayed home on Tuesday. She said, I'm not going to Disneyland. There's no way. So, but we had a really good time. It was, it was fun. Uh, our grandson, who's five, had a blast. Ryder just ate it up. He, uh, the, the whole uh, Disney parade there at the end and the fireworks show was just, it was, uh, it was magical. It was really, really a good time. So anyway, we had a good time first part of the week um, and uh, got back and, and got into the Word uh, this, this week and, uh, you know, studying, preparing for this message. And, uh, and God just really blessed me in, in, in my study time. You know, a lot of times, you know, your study time and your quiet time. If you've ever taught a Bible study, you know, your, your study time doesn't, doesn't uh, equate to your, to your alone time with Jesus. I mean, it, you get a lot out of it, but you've still, you've still got to spend time with Jesus and devotion time and quiet time and in prayer time. Because, it, you know, it, it's, it's from that that stems the, the fruit from your study time. It, it, it just overflows into your study time. The, the, the direction of the Spirit. And so, um, so anyway, it was, a, it was a good week. It was a good week. A lot accomplished and, and uh, excited to read and study our text this morning with you guys. So here we are in Ephesians chapter 4. And, uh, and here, here Paul is, is changing his tone, so to speak. Living to the glory of God or living in God's glory is the title of this message. We're only going to look at the six, first six verses this morning of this passage. And again, Paul has a, it's a transition in the letter. Up to this point, we have studied 66 verses, if you're reading out of the New King James. It's a little different other translations. But uh, here in the New King James, 66 verses in the first three chapters. And much has been said regarding our position and our condition, our needs and what God has done in establishing the church. But with very little exhortation. He's put out doctrine. He, he's been revealing what he's done and what he was going to do. But with very little uh, commands, if you would. Up until this point, the Apostle Paul has just been uh, just laying out the plan for the church. Now, the exhortations, they're going to flow. From this point, from chapter 4, verse 1, they're going to flow. And it's been said that the rest of this book, all the exhortations from here out, will all rest on this one exhortation in, cha in verse 1 of chapter 4. Everything kind of stems or builds from that. In fact, all exhortations in God's word could be used as, as this being the foundation of all exhortations. As we look at verse 1. In my study time, I thought of a quote years ago that I'd heard. I don't know who wrote it. I don't, can't remember. I didn't write down. Usually I write down on my quotes uh, who, who said it or where I heard it. But it went like this. The cross, a place where right and wrong made up its mind. There's a lot to be said there. Because under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, when we look at the cross, or we've come to the cross, it what? It reveals that we're not righteous, that we're sinners, that we're separated from God. And, and, and the cross itself kind of demands a decision, doesn't it? Do you believe? Are you going to trust? Did Jesus really do this for me? The decision has to be made. The cross brings us to the place of decision. Well, we're going to choose. And from, from that point out, the rest of our Christian walk into the process of sanctification, where we are continually being set apart as children of God, we always keep coming back to the decision. We come back to the cross and we come back to a decision. Are you going to give that area of your life to me? Are you going to trust me with that wrong thinking, with those wrong ideas, with that wrong attitude? How about that unforgiveness that's in your heart? Are, are you going to trust me with that? How about that kind of that hatred you have towards that brother or sister in the Lord that hasn't really done anything to you? Or maybe they have done something great to you and you're, and you're 
harboring feelings. And, and so we're constantly coming to the cross with attitudes and sin. It's not of God. That he's wanting to weed out of us. Get rid of it. Let it go. And so the statement is so true at the cross, a place where right and wrong made up its mind. And I pray that the cross for me and for you is always a place where we make up, we, where we make up our mind to choose God, right? To choose his rightness, his righteousness, and to leave our wrong at the cross. And so that, that quote made me think of how, you know, millions of people have gone to the cross and, and how they've left, you know, they've left their sin and they've turned from their ways. And now it just doesn't leave us there. And our passage doesn't leave us there. The gospel, the truth of the gospel, doesn't leave Christianity and children of God there, but he wants to build us up. You know, the New Testament is full of exhortations. I love it. It's just, it's just constantly built on exhortations. Whether it's, whether it's to fight the good fight of faith or to abide in me, Jesus says, abide have you ever seen how many conditions the word if, Old and, two, old and New Testament alike? And I'm not, I'm not saying that we're, we're saved by our, our works. But our condition, it, well, it, it needs a response. And so the New Testament is always bringing us to a place of response. To a place where, where we're trusting God in a greater way. Such as, be imitators of me, God says. Be imitators of me. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Before we start, look at what it says. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of conduct. Will, oh, excuse me, will of God. Now our passage this morning is going to be talking about walking worthy in verse 1. And then he, he goes through how we do that, and then he ties it up with the unity in the faith, the unity in the church. And it kind of brings it together. Just in these six verses, there's a lot said. So with that, let's pray. Let's open this word with some prayer. Lord, we ask that you would bless this time, and that we'd find strength in your word, that God, that you would reveal your plan to us, and that we would take this exhortation, this encouragement, and Lord, that we would just fly with it, Lord, that we would take it to heart. God, that we would set out to walk uh, according to your grace and your mercy that you've bestowed upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we just read here in Romans 12 that, that Apostle Paul is writing, and he's using the same terminology as in verse 1. He says, I beseech you. You know, I, to me, it, it's almost like it, he's saying, look, I beg you, come on. Now, realistically, he's saying, look, I encourage you or I exhort you to. But it's almost as if in this lowliness and gentleness that we're going to look at this morning, Paul is like, I beg you, I beg you, therefore, by the mercies of God, by what God has done in and through you, and for you, that you listen to what I have to say. Let's read our passage. <clears throat> so in Ephesians 4, verse 1 through 6, Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, 
one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Paul was a southerner at the end. <laughs> y'all. Hey, y'all. And <laughs> that's true. He just spoke like a southerner. So he's definitely, definitely in the end, he's, he's definitely incorporating everybody. I've heard it taught a million times and said a million times. All in scripture means all. All. He's done this for all. For all of us. So again, you can see here in our passage, he says, therefore, Paul is hinging on the fact that it, everything that I've said. So we're going to look at some of the stuff that we've already taught in some verses this morning. And then he says, a prisoner of the Lord, I beseech you, I exhort you, I ask you. Paul spent the last three chapters spelling out this in glorious detail what God has done for us and his purpose for the church. Now he brings a call to live rightly, but only after again explaining what God has done for us, who we are. In fact, just for the fun, if you would look at chapter 1, verse 3 real quick. We don't have that on the board, Alan. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has... Blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should what? Be holy and without blame before him in love. It's easy to say that when he says therefore, he's thinking of that statement. That's what took me back. Because of God's great love. And the work that he's done, he says that we would be holy and without blame before him. Because of his grace and because of his mercy. And because he's gracious and because he's holy. God, I, I want to be like you. You know, every little boy wants to be like their father. That's if the father's a good father. You know, I want to be, you know, you look back and he walks like dad. He talks like dad. You know, when you're in the garage, or maybe you're on the computer, maybe you're not a garage guy, but nonetheless, he, he, you see, you look back at five and six, and they begin to follow in your footsteps, and you're like, oh, man. And so sometimes that's a good thing, right? You're going, wow, that, look at my, he's a chip off the old block. Goes, whoa, 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 don't, don't do that. Whoa, 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 don't say that. <laughs> Ooh, man, I should change my language a little bit. Right. Well, not so with God. God is perfect and holy, but in the same way, God wants us to, to follow after him. That's just a constant throughout Scripture. Follow me. In fact, even Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. That's a huge statement when you think about it. And so this is what he's saying. Therefore, God has given you everything. And so he says, a prisoner, a prisoner of the Lord. Paul's appealing to the church as a man himself. He's a prisoner of Christ. I said last week, he's not a prisoner of Rome at this point. And he knows it. He's a prisoner of Jesus Christ himself. That's an awesome thing, especially in light of what he's going to say. Follow me as I follow. You know, and so we, we think of, of what that means to be a prisoner of the Lord. He is bound, hand and foot, by what God has done for him. And it's not like Paul is living the rest, out the rest of his life trying to repay God in some way. It's not that at all, folks. The Apostle Paul, here he has spent the, his life from the point of conversion, living his life in, in just a way that's acceptable and pleasing to God. It's in response, it's a life that's in response of what God's done. Not, not because he's trying to pay God back. You, you could never pay God back for what he's done. You don't have the ability to pay God back. And God doesn't ask you to pay him back. God says, just allow what I've done for you to be a response. Let your life be a response of what I've done. And so that's Paul. 
He is a prisoner who is bound by the love and the grace and the mercy of God himself, living under a deep conviction himself to walk worthy of the calling with which he himself is called. Again, he, he's not a prisoner of Rome. He's a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And I dig that. I really, really like that. And so he says, again, I beseech you. Me, personally, I take it as kind of like, come on, man. Not, not that he's on his knees, but he says, look, man, listen, I beg you. Take what I'm going to say seriously. Take this exhortation to heart. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. I beseech you. I'm pulling on you. Hey, I want to get your attention. I beseech you to what? Walk. Walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Paul is calling for a response on our part and on the part of the Christians in Ephesus. Christians everywhere to what? To understand how much God has done for them. And it's clear that the response is a faithful walk that is worthy of God's purpose and plan for your life. Now, I know, I know my walk changes, you know, in, in, in my life. I, and I'm grateful that <clears throat> the habits that I had 10 years ago aren't the ones that I'm, I'm giving to God today. The struggles that I had 20 years ago aren't the same ones that I'm giving to God today. It's, it's different. There's growth in my life. Have I arrived? Have you arrived? Not even close. But there's this worthy walk that we're seeking after. And we never arrive. You never come to the place where you say, man, I hit it. I've hit the plateau. My walk's tight, man. Now, you might feel like you're really in a good place with God. That's a great thing. But that place where you think you've arrived never happens. Never happens. But there should be some change. There should be some ongoing growth in our lives as we walk in faith before God. You know, my pastor, he used this analogy years and years ago. I was thinking about it. His little boy, Timmy, who now serves the Lord, and, and uh, gosh, he's almost 30. He said, <clears throat> when Timmy was little, we'd put him in the kitchen, and we'd open some of the lower cupboards, and he'd pull all the Tupperware out. <clears throat> and Timmy's a drummer. And, but even little, he'd pull the Tupperware out, and he'd be banging on the Tupperware, sitting on the floor and bouncing Tupperware off the cupboards. He just loved to play in the kitchen with just Tupperware. Just, but... You know what? If Timmy was still doing that at 20, there's a problem. Now, Timmy at 20 is playing the drums, and he's making a joyful noise to the Lord. It's skillful playing. And so, too, with our life, as I think about it. There was a time when I first gave my life to the Lord where I was just banging on Tupperware. You know, my walk, it was new. I was learning how to walk worthy of God. But we should expect some growth in our lives. It should be kind of a, a mark on the wall, a, a bullseye, if you would. I I'm, I'm really want to walk worthy. I want the, all that God has done for me to be exemplified in my life. Here it is, Lord. Here it is. Walk worthy. Now, so just for the fun, let's look at some passages. Alan, if you put chapter Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 up on the screen. We, we had already read, for example, Paul said in chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, And you he made alive, who were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the son's obedience, of disobedience. That was us. Paul's reminding us and, and he's reminding them that you were lost. At one point. But you're not lost anymore. There's a response. But God. Ephesians 2. 4 through 10. But God who is rich in mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses. Made us what? Alive together with Christ. And he reminds us by grace you have been saved. And raised up together. And he made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. What? That in the ages to come, 
he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Again, for a grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Again, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus beforehand, that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship, created for good works. Created for good works. That we would bring glory to his name and purpose. It amazes me how the world knows when a Christian uh, isn't doing or acting the way they're supposed to. Now, the world can act any way they want. They can say anything they want, go anywhere they want. But the minute a child of God, right, does something out of cut, it's amazing. Hey, aren't you a Christian? Should Christians be doing that? You know? You ever, God ever use a, a sinner to convict you? Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. The world knows. And the world's looking on at Christianity. And they're saying, just how good is your God? How powerful is your God? My life and your life should represent all that God has done for me. The way that I live my life. The things that I do and the things that I don't do. You know, when I was an early Christian, I thought, man, I, you know, it's all just a bunch of rules. It's just a bunch of, I can't do this, and I shouldn't do that, and probably can't do this anymore, and, and the Lord won't, won't he's going to take that from me, and he's going to remove that really fun thing from my life, and I was all concerned with that stuff in my early 20s. But I realized, man, it's not God at all. It's not God at all. He has such a greater, glorious purpose for my life. I'm not even concerned about that stuff. I learned quickly, let it go. Let God have his way. He's got something so much more better, something just greater in mind for our lives. And he wants us to walk worthy. 2, 13 and 18 of Ephesians. Let's look at that. But now Christ, Jesus but now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down. Again, that middle wall of separation. He has abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death that enmity, that separation. And he came, and he preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. The latter part of our passage this morning is going to be talking about that unity that we have in Christ. He has is, he is, he is brought together the body of Christ. What we consider the church or the bride or the body of Christ is a work of God. It's not a work of a certain denomination. It's not the work of one great big awesome preacher. It is the work of God through the power of the Holy Spirit and the testimony of his word. God has built the church. God will hold the church together. And he said, and, and we'll learn that unity is at the forefront of what God is doing. And it's all grace. It's all grace. I've got a new quote, if you would. It didn't get, it's not going to get put up on the screen because I forgot to put it with uh, my PowerPoint notes. But it says this, grace is not God's reward for the faithful. It's his gift for the empty, the feeble, and the failing. Grace is not God's gift, not God's gift for the faithful. We seem to think that it is. But God's gift of grace is for the empty, the feeble, and the failing. Still talking about what it means to walk worthy, according to that, that rich calling with which you were called. In verse 1, Paul has a lot to say. Turn to me with me, if you would, to uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12.
1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12. Paul had come to the church in Thessalonica. And as an apostle, the way they conducted themselves was always scrutinized. It was always under attack. They were always judged. Are you a legitimate apostle? Are the things you're doing, are they really God? I mean, this whole thing was so new. And Paul says this in verse 1, starting, For you, yourselves, you know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated in Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much affliction. For our exhortation, our beseech you, brethren, in other words, did not come from uh, error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness did, uh, uh, God, um, did God witness, is witness, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own child, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Because you see, we had become, you had become dear to us. For, for you remember, brethren, our labor and our toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preached to you the gospel of God. You are our witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. You can see for the Apostle Paul that this worthy walk, it meant something. It meant something to the church in Thessalonica as well as the church in Ephesus and all the other churches that he planted. This was a part of that godly character that it was instilled in Paul. He didn't want to be a burden. He didn't want them to have any kind of blame on him to not listen to what he was going to say. Don't be, don't, I don't want anything. I don't want a distraction. I don't want my life to be a distraction. I don't want my life to be a burden to you. I don't want anything. I just want you to listen. I want you to learn. I want you to see what God's doing. And that's amazing. That's amazing that that was a top priority in the Apostle Paul's life. But what really gets me is in verse 9, where he says, for you remember. He calls them to remembrance. He's, he's their judge and jury. He says, you remember, you think about it, you remember our labor and our toil, night and day, that we wouldn't be a burden, but we only wanted to preach the gospel to you. In, in other words, he's saying, and then we wanted you to receive it. That was our goal. That was our one aim. If we're guilty of anything, that's the thing we're guilty of. For you are a witness, and God also and then he goes on and says how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we live or we behaved ourselves among you who believe as we exhorted you. That's amazing what he says. Now devoutly is another word for holy or to live piously, meaning showing reverence and devotion. To be justly here is righteously. We lived righteously before you. We were justly and righteously. Meaning to live properly and agreeably to what is right or done right. And blamelessly simply means to be unblameable. 
in their walk so that there's no reason or cause for criticism or to blame or find fault or, or to condemn them in any way. I, I think that's huge. And we miss that in, in the ministry and we miss that in, in the importance of that in the Christian walk. To walk holy, to walk righteously, to have a worthy walk before God. It's so important. And it's important right here before the Lord. Before we move on, we can put Psalm 84, 11. <laughs> For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. Why? No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. That is a beautiful psalm. And it reminds me of what, how Paul's, uh, Paul's frame of mind really is. Colossians 1.10 says this, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work. Remember, you were created for his workmanship and increasing in the knowledge of God. Guys, this worthy walk before the Lord, it can't be manufactured. You can't manufacture it. You can't, you can't just muster it up. And we like to try to muster up spiritual things in our lives. Spirituality. We want people to see us as spiritual. As having a walk with God. But you can't manufacture this. You can only have it if you are a child of God. First. And secondly, to have a walk worthy means that you're living your life in obedience. And that that obedience reflects all that he's done for you. You know, when you were a new Christian, were you in awe of what God did? I remember just going, oh my gosh, that's just amazing. I was blown away. But after time, it's important, but you can begin to forget. God, man, he did an amazing work in my life. It's amazing, your grace towards me. I was rotten. I was a rotten scoundrel. I was a big time sinner and I was, I was separated from you. Man, if there was a line of separation, I was at the back of the line. But God, who's rich in mercy, reached down and saved you and he saved me. Can't manufacture it. Understanding what Jesus Christ, uh, what it means, um, this worthy, uh, <laughs> excuse me, understanding what makes Jesus Christ worthy to follow says a lot about what you think of Jesus Christ. We don't walk worthy so that God will love us, as I said. But be because he does love us, we walk worthy. It's what he's done. It's an attitude of gratitude. In Christ, we're called to a lifestyle that reflects new life. The question comes up often, though. So, as a Christian, can I still drink? Can I still dabble in this? Can I still do that? Can I still kind of get away with this? You know, you know my, my question to you is, I don't know. Can you? I don't know. Can you? Does your life reflect what God has done? It's just that simple. It's just that simple. If something affects your testimony and you're convicted by the Holy Spirit, then God wants to weed that out. I have a quick story. I was a new Christian. I'm driving my mini truck in Riverside, brand new in the Lord. And the window's down because back then, kids like me, we had little trucks that didn't have air conditioning or power steering or anything. You know, in fact, they just had an AM, FM radio. And uh, so I'm cruising down, and um, I'd replace the radio with this ca cool cassette player, Right? One notch above an eight track. <laughs> and and uh, I was listening to this music, man. And I'm just, uh, 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 I'm popping my head down. Got my arm out of the window. And I'm listening to this music I'd always listen. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I hit that eject button, popped that tape out, and boom, plugged that thing out the window. And then went, what did I just do? I didn't even know what I did. It was just like this knee-jerk reaction. Boom. You know, and then I had to repent from littering. <laughs> but, but that's how God works in your life. 
Have you ever had something you were doing and you're like, man, God just pulled it out that quick? And he says, no. No, not anymore. That doesn't reflect me. That doesn't reflect the things that I've done in your life. So he wants us to have a walk worthy, worthy of, of, of the gospel and what he's done. Turn back with me to Ephesians chapter 4. K.P. Johannan said this, It is not Christ for me unless I am determined to have Christ formed in me. I love that quote. That is so powerful. It is not Christ for me unless I am determined to have Christ formed in me. Powerful. To acknowledge all that he's done. And so he goes on and characterizes this walk, this worthy walk. And he says, with all lowliness, gentleness, and long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, he would say. As I read this passage, it reminded me of Matthew 18, 1 through 4. And it reads, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, well then, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst, there's always a little boy. Anyway, and, uh, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, he says, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of God. And so Paul, too, he goes on here and he says, What? I beseech you to walk while the, the call, which, which we were called, verse 2, with all lowliness, gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another. The idea of loneliness and gentleness is a walk that's marked by the characteristics of God Himself. It's not pushy, it doesn't desire for itself, it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't um, defend its own rights or advance its own agenda. It's not big in its own eyes. It's small in its own eyes. And, and the needs of others, right? And the thoughts of others are what's big in their eyes. Lowliness is having a humble opinion of yourselves. It's to be humble or have to have humility. 1 Peter 5 5 through 7 says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may what exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. To humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. To be gentle. Gentleness is, is not weakness. I think we've, we've kind of misscrewed mis, uh, 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 miscommunicated that many times. We think, uh, uh, you know, this whole idea of gentleness is, is meekness and, and, uh, and even weakness, but it's not. It, it's, it's strength under constraint. Galatians 5, 2, 2, and 23 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control against such there's no law we want to have these characteristics of a worthy walk and he says endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace this humble forgiving attitude towards each other naturally fulfills this gift of the unity of the Spirit. He's saying, look, we must endeavor to keep unity. A worthy walk is one that's shared. Not only is it one for all to see, but it's a worthy walk is shared amongst brothers and sisters in the Lord. We don't create it. Again, we don't manufacture this either. God never commands us to create unity among believers. He doesn't ever do that in Scripture. Why? 
because he's already created it by his spirit. Just as he has spoke of in the first three chapters of what God has done in uniting the Jews and the Gentiles together as one man. There's one church. There's one Lord in heaven, as he will go on to say. So to endeavor means to be diligent or to make a strong effort to keep the unity in the spirit. That's something to shoot for. And I would say it's a major walk. What greater walk can be seen than that of, the, of unity within the church? Division in the church has caused so many people to separate themselves from God. It's one thing for people to separate themselves from the church. Hey, you know, if, if you feel God calling you someplace else, man, Clark and I will be the first to pray for you. I pray God will take you and plant you in the garden he wants you to grow in. But man, when you, when you leave the faith, when, you kinda, when I say you kind of walk away from God, that's, that's a whole other story. And see, so many times, that lack of unity within a body drives people, not just from the church, it drives people from the Lord. And that's, that's, that's bad, that's not good. And so I want our walk to be one that's worthy, right, in that sense. This spiritual unity, you see, it's not necessarily structurally or denominationally, but you see, it, it's evident in the fellowship of believers. It, it's made up in the church itself, not by some hierarchy or not by some higher structure. Again, we don't create it. God's already done it by the work of the Spirit. The spiritual unity will keep the church and take the church farther than we could ever imagine and seen in the lives of God's people who have a worthy walk. The truth, you see, it works in the church amongst brothers and sisters in Christ and it's at work outside the church in brothers and sisters in Christ. Unity is just not for when you walk in here. Unity is when you walk in here and when you walk out there. It's just not just, not, it's just, not just this, this little thing we just kind of put on. In fact, Psalm 133.1 says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. Now he goes on. Four through six, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, if you're a student and you look at this for just a second, you notice that the, the, the word one is used seven times. Seven times. He uses, look, there's just one. There's just one what? There's just one body. Regarding unity? So when you affect one part of the body, you affect all the body. When you're not connected to one part of the body, you're not connected to the body. That's why it's so important to, to, to mend relationships between your brothers and sisters in Christ. It doesn't matter Maybe they were the ones, really, if, if, you, if, you, if we were to stand before a, a judge and jury, maybe they were the ones that had the greater fault. But it doesn't matter. The word says, humble yourself, man, and go and apologize, even if you're the one that has the lesser thing to apologize for in your own mind. Humble yourself. Say, man, I'm sorry I hurt you. Remember, somebody's feelings, they might not be real to you, but whether they're right or wrong, it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter if they're real to you. Somebody's feelings are, they feel that way. Their feelings are real to them. And, and so you approach it that way. And you say, hey, I'm sorry. You know, somebody has a walk worthy and one that's trying to, endeavoring to keep this bond of unity in the spirit is always going to be a person that's quick to say, hey, man, I, I apologize if I offended you in any way or did some kind of wrong. It doesn't matter because that's God's spirit and that's God's heart. 
He says, there's one body. Just one. One spirit. It's not many spirits. I've heard that taught in the church. There's all kinds of spirits in this place. And you're floating around doing all kinds of weird stuff. <clears throat> Guys, there's one body. There's one spirit of God. And he's working. He's working in the church. He goes on and he'd say, <laughs> well, what? Just as you were called in one hope of your calling. What's that hope? That great hope is Jesus Christ. One hope. To glorify him. There's nothing else. There's nothing else. There's no greater purpose. There's no higher calling than to just bring glory to Jesus. And so he says, there's one Lord, one Savior, one Master. We all serve the same Master. One faith. There's not many faiths. The same faith that's motivating you and challenging you, the same faith that you're committed to, is the same faith your brother and sister in the Lord is committed to. One faith. One baptism. One sign, one sign of evidence of a changed life, not multiple signs. And here he's not talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He's specifically talking about water baptism. We only have one baptism. Boy, I'll tell you, the church is so divisive, especially in the South. Man, I mean, I'm telling you. It, you know, they, they were so concerned about which way you were dunked and how you were leaning. Was your arm like this or was it down like this? Well, it was up like this. You weren't saved, brother. You know, and if a preacher didn't say it just like this, that brother was that baptism, it just didn't count. I don't care how wet you got. Oh, you did it in a lake, not in the Baptist uh, baptismal in the back, or you did it in a swimming pool, or you did it how? You were wearing sur surfing trunks when you were baptized? Lord forbid you didn't were baptized in the church. And I mean, it goes on and on and on and on. And I'm like, <laughs> that's what it's doing to the unity of the body. It's just got its throat through killing and killing it. And he's saying there's just one baptism, one faith. Get over it, right? Did you understand what you were doing when you were dunked? Did you understand what you were professing when you were placed under that water? Did you understand that when you came up, it represents all that God has done in you, that you are a new creature in Christ, then you're baptized. Amen, amen. Uh, crazy stuff. And so this is what Paul's talking about right here. One faith, one baptism. He says, and there's one God and one Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. He's working. Look at the terminology. I know it's cute, but he's saying, look, there is one sovereign God. And this sovereign God is above all. He's above all. And so it really helps you with that perspective Keep the unity of the peace and the spirit, doesn't it? It makes you think of who we answer to. And, and he is what? He's uh, above all, and he's working through all, and he's in all. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't understand. Um, it's easy. To get your feathers ruffled in church. Right? It's easy. It's easy to, 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 to struggle with that walk of faith. That walk that's worthy to God. Not worthy to me or the person sitting beside you or your, your grandmother who was a Christian forever. But worthy to God. It, 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 it's, it's easy. This is a challenge. Whether we're talking about walking faithfully before God or we're talking about keeping the unity, one, in Paul's teaching here, it all goes together. That's first. Secondly, we have to acknowledge the fact that we have to endeavor. We have to make a mindful effort to do these things and understand this is God's purpose and plan for the church and for our lives individually. And, and so... If, if God's grace and his love is at the very forefront of your mind and you always remember all that he's forgiven you of, all the stupid things that have run through your mind, 
all the crazy things your feet and your hands have done and taken you, all the things your ears have heard, your mouth has said, if you remember all that God's forgiven you of, then how easy would it be to forgive me of something or, or you or your brother or sister or even your spouse, your believing spouse? What a challenge. What a challenge. Lord, we come before you. We thank you, God, for all that you're doing. And we ask, Lord, that you would be our strength. God, that you are, above all, working in your people and working in your church. And you have a clear purpose and plan for it and for our, your people. And, and, Lord, help us to, for lack of, to endeavor, to, to str even struggle, if that's what it takes, even to labor, to make these things a part of our lives. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.